So, hello to you all out there. Hello to the people who purely tune into my channel to watch these book videos. I hope you've been well. It's been a while, I know. Um, so, today I am appeasing you all because I know I've had questions and questions um, and many requests to talk about some books. And honestly, I feel like this is probably the case for most people, but 2020 for me has been a really tricky one when it's come to reading. I've had spells uh, of just being absorbed into books and just chain reading them one after the other. And then I've also had quite a lot of periods where I, I just can't concentrate. I can't pick up a book and, you know, have it pull my mind in for any matter of time or enough for me to actually uh, enjoy the whole thing. So it's been a funny one. And because of that, I don't really think I've read that much this year. I've probably read more than last year because that was a different but as equally uh, poor reading year. Uh, so obviously we are approaching a brand new lockdown here in the UK and what better way to fill your time than with some extra reading. Now I feel like the first lockdown was a point where everybody made lists, plans, goals and while I think it's great to have that kind of positive mindset and uh, challenges for yourself if that's what you need, I also think there is no need to actually embark upon this massive kind of life changing to-do list if uh, if we could put it that way because you know just getting through it is enough don't feel pressured in the slightest to be bettering yourself and achieving all these things because it's, just, it's not going to happen realistically saying that however i do enjoy reading so very much and it's a great escapism for me so i decided to treat myself to a brand new stack of books and i obviously have books on shelves waiting, begging to be read. But um, I actually remembered a comment that one of you left, it must have been on my last book video, saying that um, all these books that I was trying to get through and I was talking about ones that I was struggling to finish but wanted to persevere with, um, they said if you're struggling with them for a reason, just read what you want to read, not what you think you should be reading. And that really stuck with me and I thought that was some great advice. So instead of going out and maybe picking up a lot of things I've heard about, a lot of bestsellers, um, books that are getting a lot of chat at the moment, I thought I would just go and really take some time in my local bookstore and just pick out what really appealed to me. A couple of these are books I've heard about, books from recommendations, but others are ones that I haven't um, and just really wanted to kind of like get into because the story sounded so interesting. So I'm gonna go through those and as well, I wanted to mention if there's time in this video, a couple of my absolute all-time favourite reads. I love um, people sharing their all-time favourites because I feel like if a book has affected them that much and influenced them to say that they love it the most, um, whether they read a lot or not, there's got to be something about it. So I wanted to kind of tie in a few of those because actually I purchased quite a few of these books based on similarities to my all-time favourites. So that is a long rambly intro but let's get into it so the first book that i bought and this one i'm really excited about i've come to realize that i am definitely more of a visual person so when i just see a book on a shelf and i have nothing to connect it to it's a bit of a struggle for me to to get into it and for the story to really resonate but when it's translated or transformed into another medium so a film or a TV series, something like that. It just makes me so much more engaged. And I, I don't know how I feel about that. I feel as a reader, as a real book enthusiast, that's just not, that's just not the way to go. But I guess I can accept that for me, that is what I enjoy. So this is gonna be a rambly video already. Can you tell guys, I just, we'll, we'll just deal with it as it comes. I have actually always wanted to read this book. I think this is older than I am. I'm sure it's older than I am. And it's um, Frank Herbert's Dune in a very um, aesthetically pleasing neutral cover, which I think is a new addition. Thanks, thanks for that, um, Odder. Cover design and illustration by Sean Francis O'Connell. This is a, I think it's actually described as a space opera, which if that's not gonna drag you in, I, I don't know what is. Um, so it's a science fiction. It's set in another universe, in another world, another planet. Um, and I feel at the moment I really, I really want escapism in the form of just an absolute escape to something or somewhere that doesn't exist. Reading books that are very much set around 
people, um, particularly real life situations, character driven novels dealing with um, things that I can personally relate to, at the moment that's just a bit too much for me. It's, it's not somewhere or something that I can really get into because I just, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be reminded of life's <laughs> struggles and taken to a place that I feel is something that I'm dealing with too, if that makes sense. I just want, I want to read about a big space battle uh, for custody of a planet, you know? I just want to read something so far removed from my everyday life that I just, my brain is in a different place. Dune, if you haven't heard about it, it's been around for so long, I feel like it's the book that inspired The Matrix and Star Wars and everything like that. Um, and it's centering around the character, uh, I think it's Paul, who is a Duke's son, and the Duke is murdered, and it's all about this stewardship over a planet called Arrakis or Dune and there's a very rare commodity on that planet, it's a spice called Melange, um, it's the most valuable element in the universe and I think it's just a massive epic story, there's, de there's definitely more than one of these, there's sequels to it but this is the first and the original, um, but it's just a massive epic I think and something that I really want to dig into. I'm quite a fan of science fiction and fantasy. Those genres really seem to appeal to me quite often. Um, so I, I feel like this is going to be a good one. I'm interested to see how easy it will be to read. Um, I think it's from the 80s, maybe even older than that. No, 60s. It's from the 60s. So it might be a little bit tough to get into. I only say that because I feel like it's just going to be a real science fiction novel. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about that one. They've also just made it into a film with Timothy Chalamet. Uh, let's not pretend that my purchase of that one wasn't influenced. <laughs> the trailer makes it out to be very Romeo and juliet -y as well, so who knows? We'll see how it goes with that one. Okay, 15 minutes in and I've only talked about one book. Right, so um, I didn't want to allow myself too many bestsellers, like I said. I wanted to really find some niche and new books that I hadn't heard of. This one, however, really appealed to me. I'd heard about this a little bit, I've actually been recommended it by you guys as well, and it is The Binding by Bridget Collins. Now again, this falls into the category of being very otherworldly, it's also got a bit of magical, uh, magical realism, and I think it's set in the 19th century, or an alternative version of 19th century England, something that vaguely resembles it. I do love myself some historical fiction, I really truly do. Um, anything set in Victorian England actually, is my jam. Uh, any recommendations on that, I would love to hear them. I actually have one here, let me quickly pick this up. The Meaning of Nightness is such a battered old copy I've had for years and I've never gotten around to reading it, but I think it's, you know, along the same lines, Victorian England, murder, mystery, a little bit of magic. So I do have that, whether or not I'll get to it for another couple of years, who knows. And also actually, this one, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. I've spoken about this before. Um, I think these big books, as much as I just want to get into them, they do uh, intimidate me slightly, but again, set in a similar time, similar themes of magical realism and mystery. But back to the binding. So, this has a very interesting premise. Emmett Farmer is a binder's apprentice. His job is to handcraft beautiful books and within each to capture something unique and extraordinary, a memory. Um, if you have something you want to forget or a secret to hide, you can bind it, you can bind it in a book. Um, and then one day Emmett makes an astonishing discovery, one of the volumes has his name on it. Getting a little bit of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind vibes from that description. <laughs> but I feel like this is going to be super rich, very like gothic thriller, but magical, wonderful perhaps. Um, like I said, so many of you have said this book is great and that excites me. I always love it when you uh, endorse my purchases. Also reminds me a lot of a book that I read last year which was called The Memory Shop, which I think I have here. I have a pile of books laid out in front of me guys because I wasn't sure what I was going to mention. Um, here it is, The Memory Shop by Ella Griffin. Free to take your bins out. This one is a little bit more of like a throwaway chick lit kind of book. Um, still really enjoyed it. It's about a woman who's fleeing 
London after a breakup and she goes to Dublin back to her grandparents home and she um, has to sell off all her grandparents um, treasures things that contain memories and it actually revolves around quite a few characters and the different items and how they come into their lives and affect them it's a nice read and I, I kind of was quite enthralled by this while I was reading it I also really enjoy books at the moment set in Ireland <laughs> particularly Dublin I guess obviously as well with my Sally Rooney exploits recently. Um, so yes, The Binding. I feel like this may be the one I read first because I'm just, I'm really excited to know the story. It's one of those ones where the story is gonna really drive it for me and I can't wait to read it. So speaking previously about relatability and how I don't really want to be there right now, I have allowed myself one, um, what would we call this? I feel like this type of book is a very specific genre. It's Dolly Alderton's Ghosts. I do believe this is her debut novel. I've read Everything I Know About Love, which I really enjoyed. That's non-fiction. Um, so she's brought out her first novel, aptly for this century, and myself being a millennial, named Ghosts. This does revolve around ghosting and um, the trials of relationships in modern day. Being a 30-something and having to cope with the world around you changing, people getting married, growing up, having children, moving to the suburbs. Just a very realistic look, I think, at, at the life of a young woman. I am coming up to my 30s, it's not quite yet, give me a couple more years, but I do notice myself really thinking about my accomplishments and achievements and where I am at this phase of my life, which I personally don't believe is a realistic thing to do. I think time is such a construct and having certain goals achieved by certain ages is really something that we don't need to focus on. Um, but yes, this to me should be quite relatable. I have been ghosted before uh, a couple of times. It's not, it's not a great feeling. The next one I bought, I am also very, very excited for. Um, so this is called Breasts and Eggs and it's by Miko Kawakami. Um, so Miko Kawakami is a Japanese author, Japanese female author, and this book is quite exciting. It's one, I think, that really stands out in a very male-dominated culture of Japanese writing. I actually think this is endorsed by Murakami himself, um, who said that Miko Kawakami is his favourite young author. It does, in fact, say that right here on the back. Um, so this one is about, it's kind of like an intergenerational family story of three women. Um, I think the narrator, her sister and her sister's daughter, and um, her sister is going to get her breasts enhanced or enlarged uh, in Tokyo. It's set in Tokyo. I'm very into Japanese fiction and anything set in that country. It just, again, it really appeals to me. It really draws me in. It makes me engage so much in a story. I think it's a culture that I am so fascinated by and would love to explore one day. And for now, I guess, and particularly for most of us at the moment, that is mostly and only possible via literature. I think this explores a lot about being a woman, um, particularly in Japan, the repression of women. It's a coming of age story in here as well. It covers um, poverty, domestic violence, reproductive rights, things like that, ethics um, involving all of those. So it just sounds like a really interesting but very absorbing read. I also have here Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. Now, this is another one that kind of explores an intergenerational, um, long time span kind of plot. And I really enjoy that type of novel. This particular story is set, I think it's Korea, a family in Korea um, and a woman who marries. It's quite a moving, sort of heart-wrenching, but deep and kind of epic story. And I do find that with, with these kind of books that span over such a large space of time that they really, affect you and really with characters that you're seeing growing and changing and maturing with you you get so attached to them and um i think that always adds something to a book this actually really reminds me and i think i was recommended it after finishing reading the dutch house by anna patchett and i've spoken about this one before this one is a little bit less epic it's quite easy to read um, and it's set in America, it kind of spans across the 40s and 50s up to pretty much modern day now. Um, this one revolves mostly around 
a house, the Dutch house, um, and the family that live there and their life spanning in and out of that place, perhaps slightly more easy to digest. So if that kind of story appeals to you, but you're looking for something to just dip your feet into the waters of, I really do recommend the Dutch house. It was one of my favorite reads this year. So this is where we have a bit of a wild card entry. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm quite bad for judging a book by its cover. And this stood out to me instantly. It was on um, a table with a sea of other books. And I just thought, I want to pick that up. Um, it's Boy Parts by Eliza Clark. I think this is a debut. I haven't heard of this author before, but um, this I think is a very bold and quite brutal kind of story. Um, it revolves around Irina who takes explicit photographs of average looking men that she persuades to model for her um, on the streets of Newcastle. It's a comedy, but a very dark comedy. I've actually heard, um, I've heard this character be described as the female Patrick Bateman, which should just say everything. <laughs> I don't really think this is my kind of book, but sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I get in a bit of a rut reading the same material over and over again. And I thought it would be good to just get something that maybe packed a bit of a punch and perhaps really had the ability to pour me out of that. Um, yeah, so that is Boy Parts. I did post a picture of that today and a couple of you said it was one of your favorite reads this year, which is always great. Again, this is not really something that I would normally pick up. I feel like that's a good thing because I'm trying, I'm trying to kind of step out of that same comfort zone I have when it comes to reading. And I, I'm not, massively tuned up um, or informed on a lot of US politics. I feel like this book is very relevant right now, personally speaking, um, on the day of the US general election. I feel like it couldn't really be more appropriate, um, despite the fact that that absolutely terrifies me. So I feel like I could maybe do with a little bit of educating on that subject. And this book perhaps is not the best place to start, but it definitely falls into that category of a historical fiction, but an alternate historical fiction, which I find so interesting. I know that there's a new uh, Ian McEwan, or relatively new Ian McEwan out, which um, is an alternate history set in the 80s where Alan Turing is still alive and developing artificial intelligence and I think Margaret Thatcher doesn't have any power or is struggling for power in her party. Um, things like that are very cool to read, I think. I just like to see how things could have turned out, imagined um, in somebody else's mind, much more apt at describing it than me. So Rodham is obviously centered around Hillary, Hillary Clinton, and what would have happened in her life and in the scheme, the grand scheme of the US politics um, setting if she hadn't have married Phil. So obviously the majority of this book is fiction and I'm sure, I have no doubt, it's going to be taking some liberties to say the least. I've actually heard there's some quite graphic um, sexual content in this or sex scenes between the Clintons. Um, take that as you will. But it's also weaved in with true um, factual historical events and looking at how the implications of those to people, to powerhouse people, not being married um, affected that. And I assume that's going to perhaps cover uh, the election and things like that, Bill being president. Sounded very interesting to me. And again, I've seen so many people reading this, uh, particularly Kate, lovely Kate Lovey. Uh, I think just finished reading this and gave it a bit of a rave. Always a fan of Kate's recommendations, so I didn't think I would be steered wrong there. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about, let's see, next let's talk about this one, uh, The Song of Achilles. So uh, one of my actually probably the best book I read last year, my favourite book of the year, was Circe. Circe by Madeline Miller. Um, I am enamoured with Greek mythology. I always have been. I find it so interesting. Um, I even took classics at A level. I liked it that much. Didn't love the course, but um, still was very interested in all of that ancient history and literature, Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey. Always so interesting to me. And Circe in particular, is written from the perspective of the goddess Circe. It's very, um, a very female driven voice because of that. And it kind of weaves in these characters, these gods, these mythological um, beasts and monsters that we've always heard about, but from a very new and different perspective. Uh, and I just loved it so much. Um, I spoke about it a lot of you then recommended The Song of Achilles, also by Madeline Miller. I think this one came first. So obviously this one is a different story uh, set in Greece in the Age of Heroes. The Trojan War, um, Achilles, Patroclus, Helen of Sparta, 
all of that goodness. If you enjoyed the uh, slightly shocking Brad Pitt, Orlando Bloom adaptation of Troy on the big screen, this book is for you. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I loved that film despite how terrible the acting was and uh, how shocking Brad Pitt's wig was, if we're honest. <laughs> but that story, the story of Troy obviously, which we all know is captured in these pages and um, if anything was to be taken from Madeline Miller's writing in Cersei, I, I'm sure it's going to be an epic, enthralling ride. I feel like they also stay very true to the actual story of um, particularly Achilles and Patroclus, which is a bit more of a romance than the film led to believe. So, Madeline Miller, quickly perhaps becoming one of my favourite authors. Um, so, those are all the books, I think that's it, that I have picked up recently and wanted to share with you. Um, I think now is a good time to just quickly go through a few of my favourites that uh, if you're struggling with something to read and you want something that is going to just be good uh, that I couldn't recommend highly enough. So, I feel like I don't really talk about this all too much but my all-time favourite book um, is Captain Corelli's Mandolin by Louis de Bernier. I read this when I was so young and it just has always stayed with me, the story. I think it was the first novel that I got so enthralled in and so connected to the characters, um, the plot, ev everything. I just felt like I was home when I was reading this. It's set in, uh, it's 1941 and it's set in the Greek island of Cephalonia. Again, enamoured with Greece and any story set there, modern or <laughs> ancient history. Um, and it's set during the war, obviously, and the occupation of that island. I guess it's fair to say it's a love story, um, or it's a love story set amongst this backdrop of war, um, in a place that we're not perhaps that familiar with hearing about, the occupation of these smaller islands and what went on there. Um, it's just a really emotional and gripping and beautiful book. Always has been and always will be one of my favourites. Speaking of Ian McEwan earlier, um, Atonement, I really haven't read enough Ian McEwan and I have a couple on my to read list here which is just growing ever more by the second. Um, I have On Chessel Beach and Enduring Love which I still I still really need to read but my favourite of course has to be uh, Atonement. I read this actually before I saw the film and then I watched it and kind of everything came to life and it's one of those magical moments where I feel like they're both as good as each other and they enrich the story both ways. Um, Atonement is a beautiful book. I feel like all of Ian McEwan's writing is just special. Um, and this one is set again in kind of 30s England. It starts with a 13 year old Bryony Tallis who in the film is played by a very uh, young Saoirse Ronan who I think that's the first thing I saw her in, maybe the first thing she was in and is brilliant. We see things from her perspective and what she thinks is happening when her sister, Kira Knightley here on the book, and um, Robbie the gardener are intertwined in this will they won't they kind of love story um, and then we progress throughout her life and how her decisions and the choices that she's made uninformed or not because of her age um, are affecting everyone else around her. It's just it's quite a sad book um, but it's so worth a read and I've probably been through it a couple of times now. It's been a while and I would love to sit down and read it again. Also I wanted to talk about The Time Traveller's Wife. Now, when I first read this, I wasn't sure that I actually liked it, but I thought about it for probably the next three or four years. Uh, I read this a long time ago, and it's it's just another one that is such an engaging story. The Time Traveller is Henry, who jumps through time in a very interesting and new, like not so much explored kind of way. It's involuntary, it's something that's part of his DNA, um, and it, is a love story. It follows the story of him and Claire uh, and their various different encounters throughout life and how at times one of them knows the other but the other one hasn't met them before and how time travel basically can affect a relationship. Again this one was made into a film with uh, Rachel McAdams and I think Eric Bana. It's a great film. There are parts of this book that actually hurt me and I think 15 year old me, 15, 16 year old me reading this was just so invested but I still think it's so well written, um, so interestingly done. Just a great, great read. I wanted to also talk about a few books that are maybe a bit more historically favourites to me. And I feel like now is the time more than ever that I'm clinging on to nostalgia in every form I can get it. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think finding 
those memories or moments in time that make you feel safe and comfortable um, are a great thing to try and seek out at the moment. And for me, reading is a massive part of that. There were quite a few books I read as a child that I still feel, I still get a lot of comfort out of. So uh, it seems kind of ridiculous to mention this in a book video, but um, I, did, I did get this new copy recently, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, by um, the author we shall not mention because she's being a bit problematic at the moment, to say the least. I am definitely not an advocate of cancel culture. I think it's a very dangerous and just not great thing, but um, it's up to you and it's your choice to decide whether or not you want to engage in literature created by people who have since shown perhaps their true colours. For me, I have to kind of draw a divide in it and separate that and, I don't know, I guess it's a personal choice. If something is so valuable to you in terms of what it can do for yourself, for your mental health, your anxiety, I don't know, it's a decision that you have to make. For me, going back to Harry Potter obviously will always be such a comforting, happy place for me. Um, and if there ever was a time to resort back to nostalgic fiction, it is now. So um, I haven't read them for a really long time actually. I used to do them about once a year and the older I got, the um, the slower that got. And despite me being nearly 30 and it obviously being children's book, anybody can read it. They actually have quite a few new editions I've seen that are very geared towards adults. They look like crime thrillers. Uh, the covers are very interesting. Um, another one, which perhaps some of you haven't read, I feel like the uh, Historic Material series wasn't quite as popular as Harry Potter, although it may be that I was a bit too young for it. I think this came out before. Has that similar kind of alternate reality, magical feel uh, in a very different way. Some of the themes that this one explores are maybe quite a bit more adult, based a little bit more in religion and the implications of that. Reading this as an adult, because I did reread it recently when um, they brought out the BBC series, uh, finally a good adaptation of it because there have been some bad ones before but it's pretty good. I think the new, I think the second season which should cover everything in the second book in The Subtle Knife is coming out this week, next week on BBC. Definitely recommend a watch of that but I did reread these when that happened um, and noticed or picked up on a lot more that I don't think I did as a child. I feel like it affected me a lot more as an adult reading these. Um, so really heart-wrenching moments. There's some real deep emotions to deal with that I think as a child I probably just skipped along past and didn't even notice. And then something a little bit more classic, one that will always be a favourite of mine is The Great Gatsby. I read this um, in while I was doing A-level English literature and hated every second of it. I think it's very common to end up hating the text that you have to read and reread and analyse and write about um, over and over again. I think most people ended up um, destroying their copies of this after they were finished, which now that I think about it is pretty horrific. Uh, I didn't do that. I'm sure I still have an old copy back at home, at home, home. Um, but this is a slightly newer one. But The Great Gatsby will always be one of my favourite stories, um, set in the bright and buzzing um, post-war America with so much richness and elegance, parties, exuberance, just money, money, money. Um, on the outside and then underneath that, that kind of more seedy, gritty and tragic lives and stories lying under the surface. It, I mean, it's a classic for a reason, it's studied for a reason. It's funny how I came to loathe it so very much when I was studying it, but now um, it brings so much nostalgia and, and warmth for me. So I, I think it's fair to say that it'll always be a favourite and it's a really easy one to reread. I've reread it quite often. I remember the first time I picked it up again. I just enjoyed it so much. And of course, it's it's one of the best Baz Luhrmann films out there. I, I don't really think you can <laughs> beat uh, Leonardo's Gatsby. If only for the soundtrack, actually. It's, it's great. Okay, so I think we will call it there for a day. Uh, it is not lost to me that I now have to go and edit this video. <laughs> it should be quite time consuming. So um, that was my book haul and a couple of my favourites. I'm going to leave everything listed down below. A quick mention, last of all, if you can and you have the means, I think right now it's so important to try and support our local bookstores. Mine personally are closing but they're still available for pickup. You can order online or you can mail order which is really really great and I know that not everyone really has the means to do that. 
Some people might not be able to get out. Um, obviously things like Kindles and e-readers are great for that. You might not have the means to afford to buy, you know, an actual physical copy of a book as well. Um, but I think where we can, it's important to make those small choices that maybe affect you ever so slightly, but can help a struggling business out massively. I think bookshops especially just really are struggling at the moment. Um, instead of buying on Amazon as well, I found a great website called Hive, which is very similar in its layout, but you can order from independent booksellers. And the shipping is still relatively quick, I think. It doesn't take too long for books to get to you if you are just dying to read them. So that's always a good one to check out. I'll link everything down below. Uh, on Hive where I can. So I really enjoy making these videos and um, hopefully you enjoy watching them too. So yes, I will leave you here for today. Um, you may have noticed this video is going up on Wednesday. I'm going to try and upload three times a week right now. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you guys soon. Bye.